All right, man. So uh, just first impressions, what do you think of the book? I know it's one that's usually signed in school. Uh, I didn't read it at school, but yeah, I never, I never read in school either, but yeah, just reading it. I mean, it's really impressive the way that it's about 90 pages long, but there's so much kind of packed into it and a child could kind of read it, you know? I mean, it's literally a book about animals, technically, but there's there's so much subtlety into it, though, is the thing, you know, that you, if you just read on the surface level, you might miss a lot, but really there's, yeah, there's a lot to, I mean, there's a lot of references to the to history, to the Russian Revolution, obviously, but uh, it's, yeah, it's really interesting how well uh, George Orwell gets right just kind of how these kind of revolutions happen, everything. And yeah, I mean, just the whole premise of the book that the revolution could start uh, in this form of oppression and then circle back around, end up in the same exact place it was. And just the way that he articulates that so well, of how it happens, every detail, kind of how it comes about. So it was, it was very impressive to me. Yeah, that, that ending is really cool when it comes full circle and you realize like, oh my gosh, it, the, the whole thing yeah. is, you know, back where we started or back where they started. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Um, and that's true. I also think these great works, they're applicable in so many ways. Like, of course, there's historical references, which he probably had in mind. But then mm -hmm. also now, like, we can apply them and I can see the same type of stuff going on yeah. in society. And I think that's mm -hmm. what also makes this work you know um pass the test of time i guess yeah absolutely um i didn't know i did a little bit of reading about uh george orwell earlier just on wikipedia did you know anything about him going into this or so not much i read 1984 a couple years ago and i also love that i feel like 1984 was maybe kind of like an expanded version of George Will for like a more mature audience, maybe. I mean, I think that one's maybe 300 pages or something. And, but yeah, I didn't know much, much about him either. I think I also maybe just did like a quick research. And uh, I guess I remember seeing that he said, you know, he swore to always write against totalitarianism for kind of the rest of his life. And so that's kind of the obvious goal of both his two main works. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't know a lot about him, but uh, a few things that I did kind of stumble into are interesting. He seems almost to be a little bit of a contradictory character. Um, one of the things the article was talking about how he, I guess, was an atheist, but then also mm -hmm. kind of also liked the Anglican Church and would go to church. Uh, I, forget, I think it was called Holy Communion, his parish, got married in the Anglican Church. And then has to be buried with a funeral rite from the church. Mm -hmm. So um, same thing, too. I don't think he liked Catholics too much. He mentioned kind of criticism of Chester yeah. of Chesterton and <laughs> Evelyn Waugh, okay. although recognizing that they're both good writers. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of interesting to me. And then along the same lines of being kind of contradictory. So obviously we are drawn to his books because they're so against totalitarianism and Marxism and communism. But then, which he was, <clears throat> mm -hmm. but he wasn't necessarily a capitalist from what I gathered. He seemed to support mm -hmm. a lot of social liberties, but then also something like um, sort of like a socialist economy. And I wonder if that's because, well, he wrote that book, um, Wigan Pier, The Road to Wigan Pier. Um, I wonder if that's because he had an insight into also those sort of like blue collar workers and how much they suffered at that time. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know. I thought that uh, was kind of surprising that there's sort of these contradictory forces in there, because as far as reading 1984 or Animal Farm, he is totally against communism, Marxism, propaganda, mm -hmm. suppression, and all those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense, because one of the last things that I was thinking about is how you know, obviously the whole thing is kind of a criticism of totalitarianism and everything, but he never really offers kind of what his solutions are ever of kind of what government should be of what should replace totalitarianism. It's, it's all kind of just a warning against it, but 
Yeah, it's it's interesting how he never offers a solution. And I guess I have to wonder, maybe he didn't really think he knew enough himself to kind of put forward that, but only to make the criticism. Yeah, and he died quite young. I think he was in his 40s. So hmm. um, maybe he was still searching at that point in his life. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. All right, jump into the story here. One of the things I wanted to talk about is a term related to Marxism. Uh, I believe the technical term is dialectical materialism. Now, I'm pretty sure Marx, being sort of like a quasi-descendant of Hegel, um, is taking sort of that dialectical movement of history from Hegel and then combining it with uh, materialism of the 1800s, kind of putting those two together, this idea that there's no like universal essence or eternal essence to things. If you think like Plato, we know the eternal forms, right? Teleology, things are what they are, and they're always going to be like that, and they have a particular end, Mm -hmm. and so society has like a structure built into it. But communism, I think, is built on this idea that there's no inherent structure to anything. Everything is like clay, like it's whoever the person in charge is kind of molds the Mm -hmm. clay of society Mm -hmm. to be whatever um, they want it to be. And so I think that's where it kind of um denigrates into power um and i think one of the biggest mistakes with dialectical materialism is a denial of human nature Mm -hmm. because power corrupts and uh humans you know when they're given absolute power pretty much are basically going to be corrupted so i think to me that's what kind of like stood out in a lot of ways is like this whole Mm -hmm. idea of the utopia of marxism of bringing Mm -hmm. about the perfect farm Mm-hmm. I don't think it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's interesting because uh, one of the questions I had is kind of the beginning of the book, the, you know, the the pig, I think his name is like old mayor or something like that, is given a speech and, you know, it's all directed towards man. And it says it's always man with a capital letter, right? And I almost had to wonder if maybe – it's not a coincidence that George Orwell chose animals who overthrow men, right? And, you know, he specifically says the enemy, our problem can be summed up in one word, which is man. Man is the enemy. And I almost wonder if that's Orwell kind of hinting at that all these revolutions have sort of a destruction of man, the essence of man, and uh, a sense of becoming animal-like because of that. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, connected with that, um, for the communists, I guess, this whole term of social engineering, what stands in mm-hmm. the way of the utopia is the past. And the past yeah. is right made up mm-hmm. of traditions of men, which we preserve saying like, hey, these are valuable. These are worth keeping. So as we destroy like the wisdom of our fathers and, and mothers, what I mean, what is that? leave us to inherit maybe it just returns us to being an animal like you were Mm -hmm. saying like yeah yeah um so that was that was uh my first thought second thought um this i guess is more related to later in the book is if society is just like a ball of clay and whoever's in power gets to shape it well then if let's say i think i know best how it should be shaped Am I what am I not justified in doing to bring Mm -hmm. about the shaping of that? Mm -hmm. So it's like if I lie to you and I still get the end that's best, well, then that's a good thing, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's uh, obviously that's that's part of the story is that so they have this guy, this pig, I should say, Napoleon, who takes over and systems that they go by is that if Napoleon says it, then it must be right, you know? And uh, yeah, it's, it's obviously a faulty logic, right? Because there's no human that's always right, but that's the maxim they follow, you know, it's catchy enough and everybody repeats it and it just becomes part of society. And then, and there's sort of this worship for this guy, Napoleon, Uh, you know, he's got guards going around with him. Anything that he says goes, if anything goes wrong on the farm, it's because, someone did something against him if anything goes right in the farm it's because he did something good obviously 
So yeah, it's interesting, sort of this kind of idolization of the leader. So what it kind of brings up the question, I guess the postmodern idea of truth would be whatever you can get people to think is true. Mm. Um, but I don't think you or I would agree with that. I think we probably argue mm. truth is what it is in and of itself. Right, but right. I mean, there lies a lot of the tension of today. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's something that changes in philosophy over time. And something that I was actually just thinking about today is how is the notion of truth and how it, how it changes from obviously the the correspondence between the mind and reality to really just the mind, whatever you can think of, whatever is clear to you becomes the truth later on. And then if you're the one who ends up being in power, <clears throat> you can kind of then implement your vision on on everybody yeah. else um mm -hmm. okay so moving a little bit further here um i personally pulled out a few different tactics that i noticed that are used in the story um mm -hmm. and i found these so interesting because of what you know if you pay attention to what's going on in society with you know pop culture media politics all that type of stuff I think you, in a lot of ways, can see those, at least I noticed these parallels going on. Mm -hmm. um, so I figured maybe we could go through some of these tactics and, and you could help elaborate on these yeah. and give me your mm -hmm. thoughts. So um, the first one I noticed, <clears throat> as you pointed out, Napoleon, anytime anything goes wrong, he has like a scapegoat, right? Remember, he like yeah. exiles Snowball and then anything that bad that happens, oh, wait, it must have been Snowball. He must have snuck right, in right. in the middle of the night and like you know, destroyed our stuff. Um, why is that such a, an effective tactic? Yeah, well, so going going back to my reading of 1984, one thing that I remember is that the utopia that they live in is always a war, right? And George Orwell really spells out in that novel that the reason is because if you're always at war, then people are willing to make more sacrifices, right? They're willing to give up more of their freedoms. They're willing to work harder because there's always this rationalization that, hey, we're at war, you know, <laughs> this is tough times, you know, we have to, we have to do things right now. And if that means, you know, giving up your free speech or something like that, then uh, that's perfectly acceptable. And, and this novel, it's, it's kind of the same, you know, it's always, it's, if anyone's slacking on the farm, it's, well, the humans are going to come back, you know, they're, they're working on another attack. They could be here any moment, you know, we have to be ready. We have to do all these things. And then, and then, yeah, obviously Napoleon uh, chooses snowball in the end. You know, the truth is that he's not perfect, right? Everything that he says isn't always right. Uh, and so it's like, yeah, whenever anything goes wrong, then you have the scapegoat. You have the convenience of Snowball. You blame it on him. And then all of a sudden you you still can make yourself seem infallible. Which is an interesting idea. I don't know exactly where the idea of a scapegoat in our language or culture goes back to. I'm sort of drawn back to the Old Testament in a way. Mm -hmm. um, was it, I believe, the Feast of Yom Kippur, right? The Day of Atonement. The priest mm -hmm. um, in Judaism, he he has this animal and he speaks the sins of the people from the past year over the animal. And then the animals like led off in the wilderness to be killed <clears throat> as a way of like purifying them and atoning for them. Mm -hmm. um, but this and obviously that foreshadows Christ in a lot of ways, taking our sins on himself. But this seems mm -hmm. like some type of like perverted version of that. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I think that definitely that there's a sense in human nature of a need for kind of a sacrifice a need for some for some kind of atonement and so yeah i guess the choice the choice comes down to you know what's the scapegoat going to be is it going to be a noble one who willingly accepts it or is it going to be me imposing that on another person opposing the scapegoat i remember you know, I, I said uh, last time I saw you, I was reading Ernest Hemingway's uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls. And mm. part of the story is that Spain has kind of rejected God altogether. And there's one point where these there are these two soldiers, they're talking and they're talking about, you know, right to kill somebody or not. 
And one guy says, well, I don't think that it's right to kill anyone, but I trust that, you know, I'll be forgiven. And the other guy says, well, we don't have God anymore. So <laughs> if there's no God, then who's going to forgive you? And he kind of just stops and says, well, I don't really know, but I think that somehow I'll be forgiven, you know? <laughs> but yeah, there's just that question really stuck with me, right? Is, you know, if, if there's no God, then there's no real forgiveness, right? There's no one to be the scapegoat. There's no one to be the sacrifice to take away the sins. And so I guess we turn on our neighbor in that case. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's the, you know, that's the first instinct is that if there's no scapegoat, then you have to make one. Yeah, and it's weird that even if you reject God or Christianity, you still kind of live out that sort of dynamic of savior, um, judgment, penalty, um, right. out over again. Right. Um, which is crazy to kind of think about. Um, but uh, let me read a quote here related to this. Let's see. <clears throat> Okay, so he says, um, Sobel was secretly frequenting the farm by night. The animals were so disturbed that could, they could hardly sleep in their stalls. Every night, it was said, he came creeping in under the cover of darkness and performed all kinds of mischief. He stole the corn. He upset the milk pails. He broke the eggs. He trampled the seed beds. He gnawed the bark off the fruit trees. Whenever anything went wrong, it became usual to attribute it to Snowball. If a window was broken or a drain blocked up, Someone was certain to say that Snowball had come in the night and done it. And when the key of the store shed was lost, the whole farm was convinced that Snowball had thrown it down the well. Curiously enough, they went on believing this even after the mislaid key was found under a sack of meal. The cows declared unanimously that Snowball crept into their stalls and milked them in their sleep. The rats, which had been troublesome that winter, were also said to be in league with Snowball. Um, so it's like, even sometimes where we see evidence of the real reason, it's like as we begin to project, we like that idea of like, yeah, it's his fault. And then someone else joins in and yeah, and like kind of ganging up on on the scapegoat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of the, the Cain and Abel story, right? Is that Cain felt that he had a problem. He was less loved by God. And so his resort was okay i'm gonna kill abel now yeah yeah and one of the things that i've thought a lot about recently is what happens when you add for example into that story other people and i've been thinking about this idea of like the mob mentality mm -hmm. how people when they're a one-on-one -on -one, let's say might not act in a particular way but then when you add more people in and you give them anonymity that kind of reveals something about them and you have this weird phenomena where you can have a group of people then ganging up on somebody or a group performing mm. an action or supporting something they wouldn't do if they were by themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't help but think, you know, seeing some of, you know, the, the Nazi gatherings and speeches and rallies and things um, you know, from the 30s and the 40s, if there wasn't something like that going on, sort of like a group mentality emerging out of that and, and fueling, um, obviously something so evil. Mm -hmm. As far as today, I still kind of see this going on, honestly, whether it's saying like, hey, this group of people are, is bad because of something that happened in the past. And so now it's infected the whole of society. And so and so everything that's wrong goes back to mm -hmm. this particular group of people. Um, we can kind of blame it on them, whether that's the patriarchy, men are bad, or whether that's, I guess, white people or colonialists or whatever. I feel like, or people who don't want a mask. I don't know, <laughs> you know, um, I feel like we have done that so much in the last few years is like, pick one of those groups and like, okay, they're the enemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, you know, it's an important point to know that this happens obviously in totalitarianism, but also really in any culture, in any society. And, you know, even us today, we're not, we're not exempt from that. You know, it's something that 
this still kind of happens. And, and more often than not, what happens is that you have certain leaders who are, are willing to point the way or point fingers at who's wrong. And then more often than not, the, the average person is the one that's willing to, to go with it. And like we mentioned earlier, even more disturbing when it turns neighbor on neighbor or family member on family member and people become divided by those groups or those categories. Are mm -hmm. you're part of the this oppressor category? I'm part of the victim category. Okay, you're evil. I'm good or virtuous. And mm -hmm. that creates like a like a barrier between people communicating. Yeah. Um mm -hmm. It also kind of reminds me, um, isn't the devil or like the name, the word for devil kind of connected with like the accuser or like mm -hmm. uh, to scatter people? Have you heard yeah, that yeah. before? Yeah, definitely. I heard that the the word demon, demoniac comes from, yeah, something about to separate. And then, and then obviously, and then Satan, yeah, comes from the accuser, right? And yeah, obviously that that's the job of evil forces is to, to separate us. Yeah. So I can't help but thinking like if Christ is like the true scapegoat who, who takes our sins and unites us, it's like Satan is like the opposite of that where he puts the guilt and he accuses others and he separates people. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, um, so yeah, that was the first thing that kind of stuck out to me. Um, the second one was I noticed one of the common tactics that the pigs use in the story to like when they want to make changes for something and it goes against their previous rules, they just they go and secretly and rewrite the rules on on the side of the shed. Mm -hmm. And then the, the animals are like, wait, I don't remember that. And like, yeah, it was always like that. Don't you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that that was probably the thing that I noticed the most through the book. So I got to the most that I wrote a lot of notes on. And yeah, it, it's so many things came to mind. Uh, one of them being that, uh, you know, last year in the in uni university, I had a professor who who teach me American politics. And one of the things that he was saying about America specifically is that in America, we're so we've we've gone through this the same foundation for so long of like the constitution declaration of independence and so on and so forth and he said you know we've had plenty of people throughout the years that have wanted to kind of just tear the whole thing up and kind of start fresh and everything <laughs> but have never really gone very far right but he's saying in america if you really want to change something the way that people have always been effective is to convince people that what they're trying to change was in there from the beginning in that original foundation from the beginning. Mm. And you see something really similar in Animal Farm is that they have a very simple, you know, they have this list of seven commandments and they're able to manipulate because they change each one of them slowly one by one throughout the story. And the way that they're able to do it, obviously, is controlling history. They're, they're convincing the animals that, oh, this was the rule from the very beginning. And the way that they're able to do that so easily is because the pigs and the dogs are the ruling class and the pigs are the only ones that are literate. Right. Uh, or they're the most literate. The other ones, yeah. you know, they know a few <laughs> letters, right. But yeah. they're the only ones that can really write the laws and they really abuse that education because since they're the educated ones, they're the ones that are writing, they're the ones that are controlling history. And because the other animals aren't literate, they couldn't tell you what for sure, what the original, you know, seven command was because they couldn't read it from the first place. And so I think that just went to show that part of preserving history, preserving the foundation of any country is that having the educated write down accurately kind of what happens. And if you don't, if you don't write things down, if you don't have history preserved by everyone and if the entire population is educated, then if if only the ruling class is educated, then they control history because they're the you know they're ones writing it down. So uh it just went to show that to you preserve freedom, to preserve a strong foundation of a country, you have to have the as much of the population educated and literate as possible so that they're not so easily manipulated. That's such a great point. And I think kind of highlights sort of the battle over education right now. 
<clears throat> I know in the news, there's a lot of stuff about like what books should be allowed or what should be allowed to be talked about in like elementary mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. and middle school and things like that. And um, yeah, that's absolutely true. It reminds me in the story, remember Napoleon, he like takes the puppies like from the dogs that are born and yeah. it, like it takes them away from his parent from their parents and he raises them and turns them into these like ferocious bodyguards for himself. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, I feel like the ideological battle is like over the minds of kids, right? Are they going to be brought up um, with, you know, these great works with, with the idea of truth, or are they going to be, mm -hmm. can we rewrite that and, you know, right, change right. it and, and change the way they think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest problems in America today is maybe that sure. A lot general population is very educated. I mean, it's one of the most educated societies in the history of the world. If you just look at, the amount of schooling that we have. On the other hand, schooling in the last several decades has become more and more kind of utilitarian, right? Or or just about usefulness, right? So you're studying this, but it's directed towards a particular career. And so basically what you're told growing up is that you want to get the best grades possible to get into the best school, to get the best degree, to have a job, right? But what's what we've lost is that we've lost the learning for the sake of itself, right? We've lost mm -hmm. learning as a means to be an educated individual, as a means to being a smart individual who knows to go about his daily <laughs> life in the, the wisest way possible. Instead, we're, we're raising generations of kids that the only thing they learn in school is just, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get an A, right? And if that's what we're raising our kids with, then they're easily susceptible to those in power and they're not really thinking for themselves. Yeah. And one of the most shocking things is when I see on college campuses where they <clears throat> the students can't seem to stand if there's a speaker with that, which has an opposite viewpoint, like almost mm -hmm. to the point where they have a meltdown or they have to go like try to interrupt or cancel the speech in some way and get come right. violent. Mm -hmm. I mean, the liberal education, the humanities or my understanding, universities, too. That's where you go to encounter new ideas and, and to be challenged and to have different perspectives. And then in that, you begin to form your own vision because you're critically thinking of these different opinions and different works and things. Um, own vision for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so. Yeah, you're right. We're we all like so many people go to college, but that's not you're right. The same thing as being able to think, I don't think. Mm -hmm. absolutely um and if you're so concerned with the grade and then with the, like a job and like with the salary then you don't really you just you want to give the professor what he or she wants so you can get mm -hmm. through that and like keep moving yeah. And, yeah and i saw that a little bit in the story because remember the way that napoleon gets for a snowball is that he disagrees with him but then we come to find out that he actually agrees with him about the it was about the windmill but the only reason he acted like he disagreed was to get rid of snowball so he <laughs> took a certain position not because he believed it was the truest one but be, it was because it was the most convenient and and yeah oftentimes i feel like i just see that in, in, in school today a lot of times you know somebody will get an essay prompt and later on they'll say well i didn't pick the one that i thought was actually what i believe right i just picked the one that i thought would be the easiest to answer would be the most convenient position to take. And, and oftentimes that's what people end up doing. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of an incident that happened on the USC campus. I forget. This is like a year or two ago, but this person actually just, I think testified before our state Congress and they I think passed a bill um, something about free speech in universities, but this girl was in like a group project at USC and in like their text message thread expressed like a difference of opinion about, I think it was masks or something to do with COVID. <clears throat> and then the other people in the group started like ganging up on her and then taking those messages and posting them online. And then online they started blowing up and she started getting like hate messages and, and all that type of stuff, like flooding her social media and then it, it turned into real life where she was giving a presentation in another class and like a mob of people showed up to the class and she had to like basically run or try to escape for her life. Um, and it's like, what in the world is going on? Right. 
Yeah, I mean, something similar happened, happened to my sister, and she went to public high school, and they had to take a controversial issue, and the group had to agree on taking a certain point. And so they had euthanasia, and everyone in my sister's group decided that they went before euthanasia. And my sister didn't know what to do. She said, you know, I don't believe in that. I don't want to fight for that. And I can't remember what she ended up doing. But I mean, it's just kind of a commonplace thing, you know. Yeah, so it's really unfortunate that these places of academia were supposed to be dialoguing now just become these like one sided conversations where I guess almost like indoctrination. And we're, we're familiar with the different things indoctrination into like <clears throat> postmodernism, critical theory, gender theory, feminists, all that type of stuff where I don't think they're necessarily it's okay to challenge ideas of the past, but I don't think that's what's really going on. I think it's more just like a, almost like brainwashing happening. Yeah, it tends to be kind of narrow, you know, it's like you said, the idea is you're supposed to go into school and learn all these new perspectives, but more often than not, the teachers, the professors, all are really under one kind of perspective that they're kind of forcing on the students. Yeah, and that's kind of sad because if you disagree, what are you left to do? Like either kind of try to hide and kind of like fake it or maybe get repercussions for speaking, you right, know, what yeah. you think. So that's crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> There's so much with this one because I'm, now I'm also thinking about not just like in universities, but like so, uh, the whole idea of social media and like manipulating mm -hmm. people's perspectives by giving them false information um or false uh narration of some event that happened or didn't happen or who knows right, if it right. happened or not <laughs> you know right. um yeah and that was something else that actually had that in mind was that we we have such a gap now between the people that oftentimes are the most educated that are doctors lawyers politicians that the, the average person, even though they may be educated, may not understand, right? So oftentimes we have situations where, say, they'll pass a bill in Congress where the bill is 100 pages long. The only people that are reading it are maybe some of the politicians, but none of the general public is actually reading that thing. <laughs> yeah, you know? if that. And it's, <laughs> yeah, and it's this, and there's also things like scientific studies, right, that the scientists are publishing. And because they're scientists, you know, they make it believable, right? But none of the average person is actually reading it. They don't actually know how credible it is. And so it's the same thing with Animal Farm. The lower class animals are just kind of taking the higher class's word for it. And uh, yeah, so like you said, there I mean, there's things on like social media, we're seeing all this information and a lot of us are just taking it as, as truth, you know, but in reality, a lot of people don't actually know how to do that type of research behind that study or, or read that type of document. Yeah, or even let's say if I'm not able to read that scientific paper, um, it says something to me when there's other scientists who are contradicting it, but then they're like censored or they're taken off YouTube mm -hmm. or they're labeled right, right. as conspiracists or whatever. Um, because then right there, again, you get that one one hand clapping, get that one sided conversation. And even though I can't necessarily weigh in, I can kind of sense like something's something's up here. Mm hmm. Right, um, right. So that that's also one of the reasons why I am in favor. I got in one of those like uh, Barnes and Noble nooks, whatever. And for a mm -hmm. while, I was also buying Kindle books and stuff like that. But then I was also thinking like, <clears throat> you know what, if they wanted to with these like digital books and stuff, I assume they could just like click a button and like update them and like literally change what's in the books. And so once I was thinking about that, I was like, I stopped with all Kindle. And now I try to, I only buy like physical copies of books. And even then I'm kind of thinking more like, I try to find like older copies of books um, hmm. because I don't know, I just kind of see a trend. I, I wonder if some of these things are going to be changed in the future and you're mm -hmm. not going to be able to get a copy of certain things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I've never thought about myself, but it, it's true. You know, we don't we don't know for sure if we're like the animals in Animal Farm and the the pigs are sneaking in and I add an extra words <laughs> to the commandments and everything. You know, we have no idea if that's happening. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> I think I saw the other day 
Um, I wasn't familiar with this writer, but a friend of mine uh, likes the writer P.G. Woodenhouse. And he was saying how some of his works were deemed unacceptable and they were like, I guess, making new editions that took parts out or something like that. Or, mm. And I was like, oh, man. So, yeah, in a lot of ways, I think the if there's a battle going on, it's kind of a battle over truth and perception and information right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And it doesn't really seem like it's going to slow down because everything is just getting more and more digitized and digital. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm 21 years old, but I have no idea how to navigate a library. Like if you told me to, you know, go find this book at this number. <laughs> I wouldn't know because I, I've only grown up with digital and it, it's it's getting worse and worse. You know, the kids are today are relying even more and more on, on technology for all their information. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if you rely on, one of those apps like TikTok or Snapchat to get everything and you're only getting mm -hmm. one side of it. Like, right. I don't not taking any side on the Ukraine war. I just simply, I was confused as what, who's good, who's bad, what's happening. Because I remember um, at the beginning of the war, they were like these news reports, the ghost of Kiev and the snake Island people. And then those things turned out to be like made up. And then I was, I was like, wait, wait, that's not even re real. Mm -hmm. So like, I felt this with that, the whole Ukraine war thing. I don't know what to believe. Right. Um, right. Mm -hmm. So, whew. yeah. Another thing that uh, I was thinking about and another professor was saying in my Western civilization class is that history can kind of mean different things. Right. So there's the scientific history of the thing that actually happened. Truth. Right. And then there's history that's just man's interpretation of it, the writings we have from it, all the types of documents. And so ideally, you want those two to be pretty much the same thing, as close together as possible. But there's people like an animal farm where the pigs are intentionally taking advantage of that to, to separate, you know, what actually happened from the history that they're passing on, the history that they're writing. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And uh, I liked your point when we last talked about the paradigm shift that you mentioned I yeah. think from Thomas Kuhn, because mm -hmm. I feel like you could take that idea and say, all right, we're going to look at this historical event, but we're going to look at it from this perspective. We're going to look right. at it as a, yeah. as a feminist. And so now that historical event, I've completely reinterpreted it based off of that paradigm. Mm hmm. And then what do you do? Like, how do you, how do you agree on anything in history where it's like you use this paradigm i use this paradigm and you know they don't really align right right mm -hmm. so yeah there's oh man there's so much uh in that um why don't we go ahead though and uh take a short break and mm -hmm. then uh we'll jump back to i got three more tactics that i wanted to talk okay about. sounds good yeah all right well, we'll be right back all right All right, so uh, picking back up here, I wanted to talk about this third tactic I noticed um, that's used in the book, and that is kind of giving off a fake appearance. So at one point, the farm's not going well, and they're starving, and everything's kind of falling apart, but the animals don't want, or at least the pigs, don't want the other farmers to think that they failed. And so they kind of like put off this facade that all the grain bags are full and our troughs are overflowing and, and everything's going so well. <laughs> Any thoughts on that particular tactic? Yeah, I thought it was funny how oh, repeatedly they use false statistics that they're throwing out there, you know, like Squealer's the spokesperson and he keeps saying, well, we have five months, five times as much grain as we used to have. <laughs> we have three times as much of this and this. And uh, yeah, it was kind of like what we were just talking about. If again, just, you know, just throwing out statistics out there. And then if you can, sometimes if you can just package it well enough and make it look good enough, then a lot of times people believe it, you know? Yeah. And that's interesting that you brought up statistics because that's exactly what I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I guess I've realized more recently is when studies are done and statistics are put out there, Again, given like the parameters that you set the study up with, if you wanted to, you can kind of manipulate a lot of statistics to say 
what you wanted to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that kind of like shocked me. I saw some statistic like some large percent of medical studies are like have this like huge percentage of error or skewed or something mm-hmm. like that. And uh yeah, you can kind of the data, yeah, yeah. right? The data always seems to rule, but the data is not always so clear cut. Right. Yeah. And there's just plenty and plenty of ways that you can manipulate statistics like that. One of the first things that comes to mind is taking my my logic class, one of the informal fallacies we discuss called false alternatives. Right. So it's mm-hmm. it's saying that either something is this or it's this, but really you're leaving out a lot of other, other <laughs> options. Right. So you might have a study and you put down two options. And the first one is, you know, I support extra government, uh, you know, get the government giving out extra money to poor people. And then the other option might be, I want them all to starve. Right. And that's, that's <laughs> actually not, you know, those aren't actually the only two <laughs> options, you know, but you can easily manipulate a study to have that kind of effect. And that's a good point too. I feel like <clears throat> um, the absence of nuance in a lot of conversations mm. today, and I feel like it's almost like on purpose, people right. like it's like well you're you're like this extreme thing yeah. and it's like wait no but let me explain and and then they don't want to hear anything nuanced it's like you're one or the other right and then you can manipulate this, that to say oh well they don't want the extra government giving out to the poor and so and then you use okay well 46 percent of people said i want them to starve you know it's something <laughs> you come up with something like that right yeah and so that kind of goes back to the danger part, right? If if each citizen in their own right isn't a critical thinker, mm-hmm. then you're just leaving that thought process up to the people who are you're told are experts. Right. But then we've already kind of established like sometimes those experts have their own ulterior, ulterior motives. Sometimes mm-hmm. they don't want to hear opposing viewpoints, or sometimes they're just wrong. Yeah. Um and so yeah, I think each person's got to be sort of the arbiter, you know, right, to right. be able to try to take in that info for yourself. Yeah, and that's one of the biggest takeaways I got from Animal Farm is just how, how, like you said, how crucial it is to be a thinker for yourself. And ideally, a democracy is supposed to thrive on that. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, debate and discourse and, you know, sharing your opinion and talking yeah, to your neighbor and that's what's supposed to be about you know but going back to the scapegoat thing right if you if i've now painted my neighbor as evil right because they're in this oppressor group or whatever you want to say well then mm-hmm. i'm not going to have a conversation with them i mean right they're rotten to the core what right they possibly <laughs> know you know yeah it's too convenient for you to have a conversation with them they're the bad guys you don't want to waste your time talking with them you know yeah and I find that so true with <clears throat> a lot of the popular atheist figures. I just have a hard time listening to people like Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris or Matt Dillahunty or whoever, not because I don't want to hear what they have to say or I'm worried about what they have to say, but I just never has struck me that they're speaking in good faith. It's always like it's always like an exercise in rhetoric. Can I use mm-hmm. words better than you can to make you look bad? Um, rather than we're trying to get towards the truth of something. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's unfortunate that it's, that it's like that. Uh, even, I think, um, the YouTube channel Pangburn did some really interesting um, debates between Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris. Things like eight hours of debates over four different days or whatever. Mm-hmm. But uh, and Jordan Peterson is like somebody that really you can engage with. I don't know. I just didn't feel like, again, Sam Harris, I feel like it was already going in so biased against Christianity or religion in general that like mm-hmm. there wasn't even really a conversation that that mm-hmm. happened personally. Right. Yeah. And it's it's almost foreign that you would want to go in not having an opinion on something. Right. It's like oftentimes like you're on this side so you should think this right and and too often that's the you know that's the way it is in in politics is that if you're part of this certain party then you have to believe these certain things and so you'll even hear some people say you know 
well, publicly, I, I support, you know, what this party says, but privately, I believe this, you know, but it's, it's interesting, because why would you have different beliefs, personally, and privately? Yeah, yeah. But we're, yeah, we tried, we're trying to like force everybody into two categories, either right, right. one or zero, X or Y, Republican or Democrat. Yeah, and right. When like, human nature really isn't like that most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's why, like, even though I don't always agree with uh, Joe Rogan, I think that's why his podcast is the number one podcast out there, because he really, at least he listens and he gives people a fair shake and he just wants to hear their experience and maybe he'll disagree mm -hmm. or maybe he'll agree, but you know, mm -hmm. you, you like, you can tell he's an honest person and he's trying to learn. Um, mm -hmm. And so at least that's what I personally enjoy about it. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see, moving here. Actually, let me read this one quote that I had connected with um, this particular tactic. So, it says, uh, once again, it was being put about that all the animals were dying of famine and disease and that they were continually fighting among themselves and had resorted to cannibalism and infanticide. Napoleon was well aware of the bad results that might follow if the real facts of the food situation were known, and he decided to make use of Mr. Whimper to spread a contrary impression. Hitherto, the animals had had little or no contact with Whimper on his weekly visits. Now, however, a few selected animals, mostly sheep, were instructed to remark casually in his hearing that rations had been increased. In addition, Napoleon ordered the almost empty bins in the store shed to be filled nearly to the brim with sand, which was then covered up with what remained of the grain and meal. On some suitable pretext, Wimper was led through the store shed and allowed to catch a glimpse of the bins. He was deceived and continued to report to the outside world that there was no food shortage on Animal Farm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which... Almost directly reminds me of a story. Um, I think there was this Russian dissident, um, Yuri uh, Bezmanov, I'm getting his last name right. But he was talking about how, uh, like in the 60s, they uh, the Soviet Union would have like other officials or diplomats come to the Soviet Union to see how great it was. But they literally had constructed these like fake cities <laughs> which which they had like you know kids playing and like playgrounds and like Gosh, yeah you know everything <clears throat> you know looked amazing but it was all mm -hmm. just a, like a facade and they would only take these like diplomats to these like fake towns and fake cities um mm -hmm. but but again to project i guess that that image even though it's not true mm -hmm. yeah well what it all comes down to is a distortion of reality right and so as we were saying earlier you know it's it's all about about changing the truth to kind of whatever you want it to be the truth is is subjective and that's what happens when you take reality out of the picture right so what the, they're they're constantly trying to doing as you said putting up a this fast gate and everything is, is trying to hide the reality of what's going on in the farm for something false for something that's that's not true and in that way they can control the truth to be you know whatever they want it to be and unfortunately well i should say i guess fortunately when we invaded germany and the war in germany was over the american soldiers we saw firsthand the concentration camps but mm -hmm. we never got to do that for russia and so i think this mm -hmm. myth of how great communism was still persisted for decades after World War mm -hmm. II and could still be kind of like upheld as this great intellectual thing. I think really it was Alexander Solzhenitsyn who first kind of mm. broke through that perception. Um, but even I think it still persists today, <clears throat> this idea that communism or socialism is, could bring about this great society. But I don't know, I, like... I always think like didn't like can't you see what's going on in Venezuela or any of these other countries mm -hmm. like where they're literally mm -hmm. starving because mm -hmm. of some of these things. Um, yeah, I mean that's a situation where going back to to history is that the Soviet Union succeeded probably in many ways in covering up the history as much as possible, and so they were the ones that were that were telling it, you know. And so unfortunately, some of that maybe the the only stuff that we have, we may never know what actually a lot of the stuff that actually went down. 
And that kind of leads into this next point. So like we just talked about projecting a false image to others connected with that is like the people in the own population that's being oppressed. It's like if you lie to them enough in a certain way, you can get them to start believing things that are different than what their own eyes are telling them. Yeah. Um, So let me start with a quote and then we can kind of unpack that. So uh, in any case, he had no difficulty in proving to the other animals that they were not in reality short of food, whatever the appearances might be. For the time being, certainly, it had been found necessary to make a readjustment of rations. Squealer always spoke of it as a readjustment, never as a reduction. But in comparison with the days of Jones, the improvement was enormous. Reading out the figures in a shrill, rapid voice, he proved to them in detail that they had more oats, more hay, more turnips than they had in Jones's day, that they worked shorter hours, that their drinking water was of better quality, that they lived longer, that a portion of their young ones survived infancy, that they had more straw in their souls and suffered for less from fleas. The animals believed every word of it. So that's pretty scary, though. If you, <clears throat> if you lie to somebody enough, you can get them to distrust their own eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think part of it in Animal Farm is that the the government of the of the Animal Farm really operates under fear, right? And so there are a few instances where you have someone speak out and say, "Wait, actually, that you know that doesn't seem right." But <laughs> like Boxer the horse says that uh, at least once. But what always ends up happening is that immediately violence ensues, right? So immediately that's when Napoleon he sends the dogs, they terrorize the other animals. And so a lot of times that it just comes down to it's easier for them to believe that this false thing that they're telling than to risk, you know, trusting their own eyes, trusting their own senses mm-hmm. and saying, maybe that's not true because in that case, they, they might be attacked for it. That's a great point. <clears throat> and I think perfectly relatable to today where if you say the wrong thing, you can kind of be attacked for it. Mm-hmm. like we were saying with those examples like your sister or that example that i was talking about mm-hmm. um attacked on social media maybe even like reprimanded from your job if you said the wrong thing mm-hmm. um shunned by friends or family um so i guess that is kind of i don't know sort of a perennial thing is that the truth is kind of risky and it's a lot right. easier just to go along with it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. I mean, it happens all over social media. Something political happens and all of one side is posting. There's not anyone <laughs> posting anywhere on the wrong side because <laughs> you know you'll be crucified for it if you if you were to, to actually object to that. Yeah, and oh man, it reminds me of um, the first chapter of the Gulag Archipelago Solzhenitsyn talking about how people were so scared to speak up against, speak out against what was happening. And they all just kind of like went along with it or ignored it or were complicit in it until eventually Mm -hmm. like it was too late. And even if he did speak out, it wasn't going to mean anything because it was like too far gone. Mm -hmm. And, and you hear people say like, Mm -hmm. why do you care about, you know, um, uh, trans stuff like with the kids what does that affect you or why do you care so much about this that or the other and i think they're trying to shut people down but really if i don't say anything and you don't say anything then Mm. you know eventually that monster is going to grow so big it's going to knock at our door and it will affect us eventually Mm -hmm. yeah it's like that one quote from world war ii where the guy said, you know, first they came for the communists and I wasn't a communist, so I didn't say anything. <laughs> then they came for the Jews. and I wasn't Jew. I didn't say anything. And then eventually it gets to and then they came for me and I had no one to say anything for me. You know, <laughs> and so it's you're, you shouldn't just speak out about things that directly influence you. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, that monster continues to grow. And for so many years, I've heard the slippery slope idea is a fallacy like that's a fallacy you can't use that in an argument that's wrong that's wrong but i think now more people are waking up and realizing actually slippery slope analogy it's not a fallacy 
if <laughs> you know mm -hmm. if let's say you know there's like a, a firm railing planted into the earth at the top of a hill that you can hold on to if you let go of that firm railing so to speak and you start going down the hill and you have nothing firm to hold on to you're going to keep going down the hill and mm -hmm. i think i think that's i don't think it's a fallacy i think it's true like we were talking about with truth if you get rid of truth nothing like firm and objective to grasp onto it's all just subjectivity mm -hmm. i mean where does that lead you ultimately right right and it's like and that's the way that the humans work with speaking out right is if you don't speak out at first and then you start seeing something happen three times and you believe three lies then all of a sudden you start thinking well i've i've already let it slip to this this point i might as well keep going with it yep yep um uh, Hannah Arendt, the philosopher, was talking about how in in Germany, at a certain point, um, people just kind of like everyday people just kind of threw up their hands and like, well, the whole new regime has taken over. Can you just give me a position in this new regime and I'll just do whatever some new job or some new hmm. role to take? Um, because, you know, what am I one person against this whole takeover? Mm hmm. So I guess that kind of goes to the point of being willing to speak out like early on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how Jordan Peterson, honestly, he became so popular is because he chose to speak out on that one bill about compelled speech. Um, and and I feel like if if one person speaks out and they're brave and courageous, then it's like other people can see that and be like, okay, you know, I'm gonna do the same thing. And mm -hmm. it kind of, it grows in a good way. Yeah. That's part of the problem. Animal farm is that there are individual animals throughout that are disgruntled, but they never stand up in a, in a group. There's never one point where they, where they do that and together they object. Which is good. And it's one of the reasons um, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Uh, thank you for taking the time to, to do this because I think, you know, like-minded people who still believe in truth and objective reason and these things, like we gotta, you know, make these connections and be talking about these things and not mm. become isolated. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. So moving into the fifth kind of tactic that I noticed, um, which is a really interesting thing going back to the, um, dialectical materialism so i've thought in the past what happens when the oppressors or the people who are oppressed the victims eventually right they're they're trying to overthrow the oppressors what happens when they overthrow the oppressors and then they become the ones in power hmm. does does the the whole movement just end or <laughs> or what about being a victim now because now you're kind of the one in power you see what i'm saying yeah, I mean, it does seem kind of that uh, it's coming to an end, that it's it's been pointless. It's it's almost like a cycle, right? And it's because if you don't have any real defined direction that everyone's following throughout, then you're susceptible to have someone take over and get power hungry once again. And then, and then yeah, you might just find yourself in that same position. Yeah, and I think that's the, one of the points it kind of makes here is like, okay, the victims come into power, but we want to keep the revolution going. So wait, we better find some new people who are who, who are undermining the revolution and we'll punish them. Right, and, right. Even though they're not doing anything. Um, so let me read you this uh, quote connected with that here. <clears throat> Presently, the tumult died down. The four pigs waited, trembling with guilt written on every line of their countenances. Napoleon now called upon them to confess their crimes. They were the same four pigs as had protested when Napoleon abolished the Sunday meetings. Without any further prompting, they confessed that they had secretly been in touch with Snowball ever since his expulsion, that they had collaborated with him in destroying the windmill, and that they had entered into an agreement with, uh, with him to hand over Animal Farm to Mr. Frederick. They added that Snowball had privately admitted them, uh, admitted to them that he had been Jones's secret agent for years past. When they finished their confession, the dogs promptly tore their throats out. 
and in a terrible voice, Napoleon demanded whether any other animals had anything to confess. The three hens, who had been the ringleaders in the attempted rebellion over the eggs, now came forward and stated that Snowball had appeared to them in a dream and had cited them to uh, disobey Napoleon's orders. They too were slaughtered. Then a goose came forward and confessed to having uh, secreted six ears of corn during last year's harvest and eaten them in the night. Then a sheep confessed to having urinated in the drinking pool, urged to do this so, she said, by Snowball. And the other two sheep confessed to having murdered an old ram, an especially devoted follower of Napoleon, by chasing him round and round a bonfire when he was suffering from a cough. They were all slain on the spot. And so the tale of confessions and executions went on until there was a pile of corpses laying before Napoleon's feet, and the air was heavy with the smell of blood, which had been unknown there since the expulsion of Jones. So I don't know if you, um, have you uh, listened to the podcast with Yonmi Park? No. She was like a North Korean um, dissident oh, okay. who escaped. She mm -hmm. was talking about how um, every week in school, they were forced to do these like accusations. So every person had to accuse somebody else of something, some like type of fault against the government or against communism or whatever. Hmm. And so, but th then, you know, I was thinking like, well, what if you don't have anything uh, that you found that somebody did wrong? And she's like, um, you have to find something, right? And so you always have to be looking because hmm. you're going to be required to uh, like report on somebody else to be punished. It's like a requirement. And um, and so it, it's kind of like there always has to be a sacrificial victim. Like you can't, it seems like it can't just end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I mean, it goes back to kind of the very beginning where I was talking about it, it benefits these sort of totalitarian regimes to always be at war because then you're willing to make all kinds of sacrifices for it because you're technically you're in, in a situation of stress. It also brings to mind. So recently I, I heard a talk on a book given by Pope Benedict that was really good. And it's one of the first things that he talks about it. So it's called values in a time of upheaval. I have, I have it here with me right now. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> nice. you, you, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but no. uh, the first very first chapter, one of the things he talks about is how, Government, it used to be the general thing was about conserving the order that was already there. And, but what shifted in the last few hundred years is government is entirely about progress. It's always progress for the sake of progress. Mm -hmm. And so continually there has to be this transformation, transformation, and there always has to be something that, that's going on. Society should theoretically be always getting better. And in the situation of you know the animal farm or North Korea, it's that progress comes about by continuously purging of the citizens. That's the idea is that mm -hmm. we're continually getting better by pur purging the citizens. And, and one of the, the quotes from the book that, that really stuck out to me is that he talks about uh, the future uh, as, as that progress that they always have to be going towards. And he says, quote, the future is an idol that devours the present. Revolution is an idol that obstructs all rational political activity aimed at the genuine amelioration of the world. And so I mm. immediately Ooh. kind of highlighted that one, you know. Yeah. It, it really stands out. But yeah, unfortunately, it, it comes in, in very many forms, whether it's totalitarianism or not. But continuously, the, the role of government too often than not is just progress for the sake of progress. That's a great point. And we were going to have a conversation before on, on science and, and scientism. But I think that's one of the main problems with, you know, today, obviously, we all appreciate science and we all exalt science. But I think one of the issues is how does science provide a value system? Right. Mm -hmm. Like science, you make progress. Right. That's how you justify. It. We need to learn these all these new things. But it doesn't really should we learn these new things? Should we learn how to annihilate mm -hmm. the world 10 times over? Yeah. We, <laughs> you know, yeah. should we learn how to create viruses that can kill people? And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Too often than not, the sign of 
what they're looking for in science, the, the progress they're looking for is some kind of technology for the sake of technology, but it may be objectively good or bad. You know, like you said, it could be inventing a, a new bomb that could destroy the whole world, but there's no real point to it. It's just, you know, it just makes us feel better that we have these kind of technology for some reason. I mean, or I saw recently an article from, um, I think it was NPR, talking about like this one lab that's trying to create a synthetic egg. So you don't need like a female egg from a real person. Um, um, you can take like a skin cell from a man, let's say, and like somehow reverse engineer it and turn it into an egg, so to speak. And it's like, it, yes, it is interesting that we can do these crazy things, but progress for its own sake, I don't think is a, is a good like basis for our value system. Mm -hmm. And that was also too, I think one of the problems, um, I did another video on um, Kant's essay, What is Enlightenment? And mm -hmm. <clears throat> he says a lot of good things in that essay. But one of the things that I strongly disagree with is him talking about how you can't have any dogma, any eternal truth. Everything has to be malleable for the future in case people want to change society. Um, mm -hmm. But but if you really think about that, it's the same with the idea of progress is doesn't that just destroy everything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, that, that brings me to... Um... Another point that really stuck out to me in, in Animal Farm is the, you know, the way that the animals are able to continuously rationalize them to themselves that everything is okay. And part of that is because they continue to believe the lie that what they have now is better than what was in the past. And so they continuously think that, well, okay, maybe things are a little hard now, but oh, it was, it's not nearly as bad as it was in the days <laughs> of Jones and the humans and everything. And and the, the biggest thing that they say is, well, back then we were slaves, but now we're free. Yeah. So along with that, the progress, a lot of times it comes through more and more freedoms, supposedly, that we we accept. And, and a lot of it, so a lot of the examples are, okay, maybe like the sexual revolution. A lot of times we take that as mm -hmm. we, we take those freedoms and say, okay, well, you know, maybe it's not perfect, but we're better off than we were in the past because we were slaves then to society. We couldn't express ourselves as freely as we wanted to be. And so oftentimes we just accept the way that it is today because because we rationalize that way. Yeah. And, it, and in a way you could say like, well, it's change. We had change. We were this way in the past and now we've changed. And hey, progress is always good. And so we need to keep changing mm -hmm. and keep evolving without really asking like progress towards what end. Mm -hmm. And I, that goes back to what we were saying with the crisis of truth. If there is no capital T truth, well then what are we really left with? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess you're kind of left with either power or I guess you could say like scientific progress or maybe some combination of the two. Mm -hmm. But, but I think the whole point of animal farm is that type of power that doesn't consider human nature right. is, is, is bound to just be manipulative. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where in general communism fails is that it doesn't consider that People have a nature. People want to own their own things. Right. People <laughs> are inherently <Absolutely. laughs> yeah. like yeah. more more invested in their own property than if it's owned by the government. You know, people. Mm -hmm. You know, all those things that I don't think you can get around those. Yeah, obviously, that's probably the biggest problem with communism is, like you said, just the absolute neglect of, of human nature. Um. The family, too, right? That was one of the things. Religion, that was one of the things that stood in the way of the utopia. But I, I don't know. I have a hard time. You know, in Brave New World, they do away with the family, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have a hard time seeing how you could possibly, you know, destroy that from human nature without some radical 
repercussion. Right. And people are still going to want it pretty much no matter what. I mean, even for society today, people are still getting married all the time, even though <laughs> obviously it's been, <laughs> it's been destroyed or it's been hurt in a lot of ways. Yeah, I always find that funny. It's like talking to certain people and it's like, no, I, I don't want to get married. Uh, no, like I don't want yeah, I don't need a piece right. of paper. But then it's like, I just. I just want somebody who, you know, who'll be faithful to me and, and, and who'll be with me, you know, if I get yeah, sick. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, yeah. And it's like, it's a part oh. of human nature <laughs> to want it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, all right. Just to kind of wrap up here, any takeaways for somebody listening? Let's say, you know, they're kind of like, yeah, I noticed some of these things going on too, but what can I do about it? Or how can I better myself um mm -hmm. give any advice yeah one of the the first thing that comes to mind is it kept you know, we kept talking about how we need to be thinkers for ourselves how we need to educate ourselves and so i think there just needs to be a bit a bigger understanding of the value of learning in itself you know and yeah of just you don't just read books for class, right? You don't just <laughs> do mm -hmm. it like you should really. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe there's a lot of people out there where, you know, you've never picked up a book in your life if it wasn't for a class and assigned it to you. And maybe that's something just a practical thing that you can do right now is just find a book that really interests you. Something that, uh, that you've always been interested in and, and just read it and figure out the, in, the truth about something that you that you've been wondering and yeah just try to learn to be a thinker for yourself and try to get a hard copy <laughs> <laughs> yeah and don't get a kindle <laughs> yeah, don't get a kindle copy <laughs> right all right man yeah i think i think in a lot of ways i've come to the same conclusion unfortunately i think a lot of people are kind of including myself sort of like i for many years was scarred from school like kind of maybe not want to read and then getting older though realizing wait a minute like this animal farm book i probably was assigned it in ninth grade but really like <laughs> reading it now I'm like there's so much truth and you know so much that i've mm -hmm. learned from this and so i think taking a different mm -hmm. view on learning i think that's a great a great point mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, great, great example of a book that you can pick up right now. 90 pages long, super <laughs> easy read. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk. And um, yeah, yeah. I think this was a great conversation and hope we uh, hope we can do it again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I enjoyed it. And yeah, I'd love to do it again sometime. All right. See you, man. All right. You have a good one. Bye. Bye.